Thank you very much for the kind introduction. It's really a, a, an honor to be asked to speak to this group. I think back that one of the very first presentations I ever gave at a national scientific uh, medical group was at the Society for Cardiothoracic Surgery of Great Britain and Ireland. This goes back to 1987 when I was a, a visiting registrar in Liverpool and uh, I gave a paper on esophagectomy when the meeting was held in Edinburgh. So it's really a pleasure to be invited back. Uh, but, but on to emphysema. Uh, I have no disclosures to make uh, uh, regarding this issue, but I will tell you that some of my very best friends are interventional pulmonologists. Um, so I, I'll take it. I have a sort of bal a really a, a balanced perspective on this, um, but my job is to advocate for LVRS. Uh, the surgical management of emphysema basically boils down to three options, transplantation, lung volume reduction surgery, and endobronchial therapy. And you've just heard some of the pros or advantages and, and the uh, role for endobronchial therapy. But in days gone by, the decision tree was basically a two-by-two -two matrix. You had lung, lung volume reduction surgery and uh, transplantation, and many uh, unfortunate patients were not particularly good candidates for either approach. So where does LVRS come from? As uh, many of you probably already know, this is, a, this is an operation originally from the late 1950s when Otto Brantigan from Denver, Colorado, described what we now know as LVRS. The illustration from Brantigan's original paper shows resection of the most highly diseased portions of a lung with heterogene heterogeneous, apically predominant emphysema. With the exception of clamps and sutures instead of uh, endostaplers and buttresses, this looks very similar to what Joel Cooper des described as a pneumectomy uh, in 1992. Although Brannigan claimed significant symptomatic benefits from the operation, this procedure was abandoned because of a high mortality and lack of objective benefit. Fast forward to 1992, Joel Cooper, then in St. Louis, and a pioneer of lung transplantation resurrected this operation and claimed both objective and subjective benefits, as well as a low morbidity and a low mortality, albeit in a very highly selected group of patients. LVRS grew wildly in popularity, and Dr. Cooper's results were not consistently replicated, likely because of differences in patient selection. And this set the stage for what was supposed to be the definitive uh, study in terms of validating lung volume reduction surgery, uh, that is the National Emphysema Treatment Trial. The National Emphysema Treatment Trial, or NET, randomized some 1,800 patients to lung volume reduction surgery versus best medical therapy and had a primary endpoint of mortality. Did surgery result in people living longer or did it decrease life expectancy? One must remember that at the time, surgical mortality for, for LVRS varied considerably, with some using it as a last-ditch therapy for patients with emphysema and others using it in a very highly selected patient population. Secondary endpoints were improvements in exercise capacity, pulmonary function, and quality of life, but the initial report from the net pictured here in 2001 described a high-risk subgroup and was rather discouraging. There was a 16% mortality in the surgical patients that had uh, an, a combination of an FEV1 less than 20% of predicted and either homogeneous disease or a DLCO less than 20%. The mortality of the comparable medical treat, medically treated patients was zero. Uh, one should bear in mind that this was not the group that Joel Cooper had initially described, and because of this, the, uh, the, these high-risk patients were excluded from further randomization. The net results were published and finalized in 2003 and compared some 600 odd patients with a surgical uh, treatment versus a similar number of patients who received best available medical therapy. While all patients had severe emphysema and had pre-op FEV1s between 15 and 45% of predicted, they had hyperinflation, a lack of pulmonary hypertension, they were not obese, had BMIs less than 30, they were not smoking, and this was checked by urinary cotinine levels. Two important factors should be stressed. One, patients with either homogeneous or heterogeneous disease uh, were, were randomized. And secondly, all patients underwent a course of pulmonary rehabilitation prior to randomization. Recall that the trial had the, had the primary endpoint of survival, and you can see here uh, that the overall survival curves were quite similar. On the left is all patients, and the middle panel is uh, the high-risk patients, 
And on the right is the, the people who, the, after you exclude the high-risk patients. And you can see even in, the, in this group, uh, the curves were, there was significant overlap in the curves, and there was ragu- rather marginal benefit uh, to, to surgery. Um, subgroup analysis, however, was where the, the key benefits of LVRS came through. Uh, and you can see in the upper lobe, or the upper lobe predominant disease, and patients with a low baseline exercise capacity, that was defined as less than 25 watts in women and less than 40 watts in men, um, there was a significant benefit in survival to the lung volume reduction operation. And recall anatomically, this was Cooper's prototypical patient. So essentially, in this group, it validated what Joel Cooper said several years earlier in his, in his uh, non-randomized uh, group of patients. Uh, furthermore, uh, exercise capacity improved more and was more prolonged in the surgical group. FEV1 improved more in the surgical group, and quality of life improved more in the surgical group. So questions as to open versus VATS, unilateral versus bilateral, duration of benefit, and cost effectiveness came about. Uh, suffice it to say that the, uh, the VATS and transternal approaches had similar outcomes, uh, with the net, sh- the net uh, trial showing no difference in mortality, uh, but sternotomy was associated with a shorter operating time, less hypoxia, and fewer intraoperative complications. On the other hand, sternotomy was associated with a slightly higher length of stay, and this is only nine versus 10 days, so it's not, not, they're not in the hospital for months on average, and fewer patients living independently a month after surgery. And functional outcomes between the two uh, sides was uh, uh, similar, but costs were slightly slower, lower on the VAT side, uh, possibly be because of the uh, slightly shorter hospital stay. As to uh, duration of benefits, <coughs> The net trial indicated that FEV1 improvement remains uh, better in the surgical arm as long as two years uh, after an operation, uh, and uh, later reports show this to extend further and to be more pronounced and to be most pronounced in the apical predominant l- low exercise capacity subgroup. This was further examined by uh, uh, Ginsburg and Sonnet from Columbia University, and they presented some of this data at the AATS meeting last year, and they showed a sustained benefit in many, but not, not, but not all of the patients who underwent LVRS, and this was not necessarily a net cohort. Uh, however, they did use the standard, net, the standard criteria of apical predominant disease. In most patients, there was no significant drop-off uh, in FEV1, even out to five or six years, but you can see there are a few where the, the, the FEV1 clearly drops off. Furthermore, it's important to note the, that the mortality in this group of roughly 100 patients was 0%. The surgical mortality was zero. Uh, in addition, Kaplan and Reese showed prolonged benefits in terms of quality of life out to six years, uh, this being in all comers, not just the optimal apical predominant patients, But it's important to note that while quality of life may drop back to baseline at three years, the relentless decline in quality of life in the the medically treated COPD patients makes LVRS patients better off out to the full seven years. So I would ask, why are we not doing more of these operations? Uh, Data from the Society of Thoracic Surgeons database suggests that 100 roughly, or just less than 100 operations LVRS operations are done in the U.S. every year with similar uh, population-adjusted numbers coming out of the U.K. and Europe. There are several possible explanations, <clears throat> but misperceptions surrounding the procedure seems to be one of the most common reasons that is cited. While surgeons may believe in the benefits of LVRS, the initial report of the high-risk group may well have poisoned the well with, from, with respect to pulmonologists and respirolo- respirologists, the people with, for, where we get our referrals. Another possibility, at least, at least as far as the U.S. is concerned, involves payment. The federal government, through its Medicare program, limited the number of programs that were eligible for put payment for LVRS initially to the 18 net centers and, sub- and, and a handful of uh, uh, transplant centers. And on, though this has subsequently been liberalized, uh, by the time that happened, LVRS was essentially off the map. Another possibility um, is uh, has to do with pulmonary rehabilitation, the availability and, and payment for preoperative pulmonary rehabilitation. But based on the data that I've shown you a few minutes ago, I think that the beliefs concerning high mortality and prolonged hospital stay and complexity of the surgery are really not based in fact. Um, in fact, I was surprised that complexity of the surgery has actually been cited because this is one of the simpler operations you're going to do, essentially just using sequential applications of a stapler, lopping off the top 40 or 50% of each upper lobe. 
Um, there are certain little caveats in the management of these patients. A lot of people have a small apical space. A lot have air leaks. If you wait long enough, they'll go away. If you put a Heimlich valve on, you can discharge patients relatively quickly, and they, should, they will do fine. Uh, the other issue, as I said, has got to do with the rehabilitation, uh, and it could be that pulmonary rehabilitation allows you to operate on a relatively robust patient with horrible lungs, which obviously is going to be better than a, than a debilitated patient with horrible lungs, although the flip side of that coin is perhaps that the rehab simply weeds out the poor surgical candidates. But the issues of, of finance and geography should not really uh, be a factor in the U.S. or in the U.K. and Europe, where the numbers of LVRS operations has also remained low. Um, I think that the per perception of the procedure, at least as far as pulmonologists is concerned, remains unenthusiastic, to say the least. A report of a survey from the British Thoracic Society recently showed that roughly half of the respondents were either unsure about the risks of death or prolonged hospital stay or that they significantly overestimated these risks. Furthermore, there was no consensus as to which patient should undergo CT evaluation with a view to possible surgery. So this is a charge to us as surgeons to educate our colleagues, I would say. There is, however, the issue of selection, and when I was at the University of Michigan, we had a fairly robust program on this, but I'd say that of, we only were able to operate on, say, one in five of the people that referred. Four out of five were just not good, good candidates, and we used the, the Cooper's criteria for the apical predominant patients. Um, there was a paper from Leicester a couple of years ago uh, here in the UK uh, where they found that roughly one in three candidates or refer people who referred were candidates for an operation. So there, there is this issue is it's not really optimal for everybody. Finally, it's a relatively expensive undertaking. Um, in the net, the surgical group had higher costs in the first year but lower in the second year and then uh, things were roughly the same after year two. Uh, Three-year three total costs were, were uh, slightly higher in the surgical arm, uh, but the, uh, um, the longer you follow patients out, the incremental cost effectiveness goes down essentially by dilution uh, because the primary increased costs occurred early in the course, early following the operation. As you can see on the slide, the incremental cost effectiveness goes down from $190,000 per quality adjusted life here, which is a lot and arguably not a very cost-effective way of doing things. But when you, when you follow patients for longer, it drops down to $50,000 per, per quality adjusted life here, which is certainly in the realm of possibility. And then if you look at the group of patients, the subgroup with a highly, the, the apical predominant low exercise group, the cost drops to roughly $20,000, which is certainly um, would be considered to be a very reasonable uh, cost effectiveness, or incremental cost effectiveness. So lastly, what about endobronchial valves? You've heard about this. I'm not going to reiterate what was heard. Uh, all I can say is that the, the valve patients typically had fairly modest improvements in FEV1, typically around 4% are predicted, as we just heard. Uh, this represents perhaps an absolute increase in FEV1 of 1% or so, fairly high incidence of low bar pneumonia, and a not insignificant uh, mortality. Uh, not trying to bash uh, endobronchial therapy, because certainly as technology improves, the, this approach will only get better. It won't get worse. Um, and perhaps the, the discrepancies and the, and the bad outcomes are likely due to patient selection. Very similar to what we saw in the days of NET, where the homogeneous patients clearly didn't do very well, and there was really no good expectation that they would, to be perfectly honest. And I think as we see the field of endobronchial therapy mature, there'll be better selection of patients, and we'll have now three things to offer patients in addition to medical management, transplantation, endobronchial therapy, as well as LVRS. So um, thank you very much for your attention.